When we are kids, many of us play hide and seek in the dark, often outside and sometimes in scary places, and we do it by choice. As kids and even as grown-ups, we choose to watch scary movies that make us jumpy for days or make us look in the shower and all over the bathroom or behind the seat of the car before we get in. We choose to do those activities that scare us and we feel the same kind of fear response in our bodies as though it were a real threat. I've told you I grew up from age eight to 18 on a five acre farm in central California and we were surrounded by other farms. One of the farms adjacent to us had these huge wheat stalks that would grow to be more than four or five feet tall, sometimes on dark nights with very little moonlight. We would gather other kids around and play hide and seek in that field. Now on the surface, you'd think that we would rationally realize that because we were so far out in the country, there was no one around but the five or six of us playing. But while we were hiding, I can tell you I was terrified. My heart would pound so hard and my breathing would change and my mouth would get dry. And I would wait and wait in that terrified state and listen for all the noises around me. Another activity we did as kids was to go at night into the haunted house that was about a half mile from where we lived. It was an old white two-story house that long ago had been abandoned and was known to be haunted. We would dare each other to climb the stairs to the second story at night because the second floor seemed to, me, seemed to be even more haunted. For the life of me, I will never understand why I or any of the other kids chose to be so afraid. My family had already experienced very real fear by then in the form of a break-in while we were all at home, so it wasn't as if I didn't know or understand real fear. But maybe there's something about choosing fear on your own terms that appeals to a child's mind or to the mind of someone who watches horror movies there are many people that watch horror movies. Or maybe it says a lot about peer pressure. But why would any of us choose to feel fear? Chosen or not, fear is something that every single one of us is familiar with because at one point or another, fear has been our dance partner. Sometimes we've been fearful for a minute or an hour or a day, and sometimes it feels like we've been fearful for ages. No one gets out of this life alive without having experienced fear in one form or another, or sometimes in all the forms. There is the kind of fear that instantly creates a fight or flight response in our bodies, our adrenaline spikes, our heart rate soar, our brains sometimes shut down, our mouths go dry, and so many other instant physiological changes. And then there's the kind of fear that lives day after day in our bellies as though there is a huge rock we've swallowed and it's just sitting there with nowhere to go or the kind of fear that awakens us at 3 a.m. and prevents us from going back to sleep. Fear has many faces and names and impacts. In his book, Dancing in the Darkness, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III writes about the very real death threats he and his church received when he was then Senator Barack Obama's pastor. Moss says this, I was caught in a cycle of worry and anger. 
I was not just walking a dark path. I had let the darkness inside me. Evil always seeks to obscure the light because once it has you living in darkness, that which should not be painful becomes so. Even the sounds of a beloved joyful child can become a part of the anxiety, the torment. Unless we have better guidance, our eyes go to the shadows. And as we peer into the darkness and worry what may jump out, the shadows become all we see. The truth I had forgotten is that very few people in the world harbored genuinely malevolent feelings toward me. Only a few wanted to do me harm. But because I focused more and more on the darkness, I felt as if I lived in a world where every shadow hid a threat. Fear becomes something entirely different when we let it inside of us and it takes room in us and begins to be a living tenant in our bodies and minds. So how do we keep fear from getting inside of us and taking over, as Moss described? Our story today from Mark's gospel about how Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey colt is a story that's missing some context. It's impossible to imagine this story about Jesus riding a donkey down the Mount of Olives as his followers shouted out without knowing what was happening on the other side of town. On the other side, according to John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg in their book titled The Last Week, this is what they write, on the other side of the city from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. Pilate's proclaimed the power of empire. The two processions embody the central conflict of the week that led to Jesus' crucifixion. While Mark 11 doesn't use the word fear at any point, I can't help but sense it all through the story. The two parades that were taking place were happening as the week of Passover was beginning in Jerusalem, which was always a week with high tension, with huge crowds of people who traveled to be there. Roman soldiers patrolled the streets with weapons and horses. There were conflicting purposes with the Jewish crowds wanting to worship and celebrate Passover, and the Roman soldiers wanting to keep the focus of worship on Caesar, who at that time was proclaimed as the only Lord deemed worthy of worship. When Jesus casually tells two of his followers to go into a village and untie a colt they would see tied there, Jesus also tells them what to say if anyone questions what they are doing. In the midst of this week-long powder keg, how would you feel about untying someone's colt and walking away with it? I would have been afraid of the trouble I could get into or cause by walking away with someone else's property. But they do it and they bring the colt to Jesus and it turns out people do ask them what they're doing, and they say what Jesus told them to say, and that answer seems to satisfy the people. Before Jesus sits on the colt, they put their clothing on it, and then he sits in order to ride through the streets. People were throwing their clothes on the ground. Some are cutting branches from the fields and putting them in front of the colt and Jesus. They were making a path so that they could honor him in the same way that some would honor a king. They followed and shouted, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of God. When I hear those words, 
I also think there must have been tremendous fear in the shouting of them. We tend to think of the Hosanna as though it were another form of hallelujah, but it's not. Diana Butler Bass writes, not until recently did I realize that I didn't actually know what Hosanna meant. I'd always assumed it was a synonym for alleluia, an expression of praise. But Hosanna and alleluia are not the same. Hosanna is a transliteration of the Hebrew term hosi-a-na, meaning, oh, save now, or please save. If they had been caught shouting these words, there is no doubt soldiers would have grabbed them. And yet they followed and shouted anyway. The parade, as it is so called, ended with Jesus going into the temple, looking around, and then returning to where the day had begun with the 12 disciples. Oddly, we could be in for a rough Holy Week, one that also positions power against Jesus, one that also proclaims a Messiah who demands adoration, which was not the thing that Jesus ever demanded of his followers. Butler Bass, also in her blog titled uh, The Cottage, did an entry that she called Trump's Unholy Week. She begins it by showing the front page of the New York Times that declares Trump has been indicted. She then shows some tweets that she sent in response to journalists using apocalyptic language and telling them when they use the language, it's more dangerous than they realize. Butler Bass then writes this. Think about it. Just a few days ago, Donald Trump held a triumphal re-entry into his presidential campaign with a massive rally in Waco, Texas, with a kind of perverse Palm Sunday flag-waving fervor. He predicted his own arrest, depicted his enemies as Satan, and threatened the enemies of God. A former president, who many believe to be God's Messiah, remember, anointed one is another phrase for Messiah, is brought before a judge who millions think is a corrupt agent of evil government. To his supporters, it will be like Jesus standing before Pilate. This could be a very strange and certainly historically significant Holy Week. For us here in Chicago, this Holy Week also cont contains the end of what many have called an historic election season. Rarely have this many city council seats been up for grabs all at one time. Most people I talk to around the city about this election are using language like, this election will make or break us as a city. It's possible that same sentiment has been spoken for many elections here, but this one does seem particularly fraught as we look at hiring a new police superintendent at mounting city debt as we recognize the pandemic money which helped fund many social programs is soon to end, and as we continue to face the horrors of violence that is out of control. In our mayoral election, the city appears to be divi as divided as ever between all kinds of issues, and our next mayor will either increase our divide or take steps toward healing. So, as Butler Bass wrote, this could be a very historically significant Holy Week. In so many conversations I've had with people in the past weeks, I hear increasing concerns and deep fear that our divisions here in Chicago and all around the country will never be healed. Many seemed resigned 
to just live in a world where we can't talk to our neighbors and even to some family members. I hear people wanting to block out the noise of the other sides, whatever those sides might be. I hear people struggling to figure out how and where to find hope in humanity and God and a future of any kind that isn't just full of disastrous event after disastrous event. So many have become like Otis Moss as he described what happened when some threats were made against him and his church and his family. He began thinking everyone was against them and threatening them. He began thinking the world is a terrible place. In his own words, he let all of the bad stuff he was imagining get inside his head and his heart and his whole body. When fear or anger or hopelessness creeps in and takes up residence in us, our vision narrows, our bodies become containers of anxiety, and we begin to focus on the chaos, and we forget how to focus on the light. Last week I mentioned that I had been in the forest for a retreat for a week, and it was wonderful. During the week, I met other participants from around the country, and some of them are people who live on land, meaning they don't live in large cities, and they regularly incorporate time outside and with the trees and with the more than human world. I found myself longing for that kind of existence as my body and my mind finally began to relax. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like to leave the city and live somewhere that is less complex, less violent, and in so many ways, less stressful. Like many of you, I've been feeling tremendous worry about this mayoral and aldermanic election here in Chicago. There's been what I would call a large boulder lodged in the pit of my stomach for months. While I do everything I can to improve the conditions of life for all people here in Chicago, I feel tremendous fear about our future here. Like Moss wrote in his book, I've let the problems take up residence in me. So when I think about Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem and I hear the desperate cries of his followers as they shouted, save now or please save, I understand their cries and I can imagine myself in that crowd. When we live in a country where people care more about the right to own an assault weapon than they do about the numbers of senseless gun deaths every year, I can easily shout, save now! When we live in a city where the growing racial wealth gap continues to result in violence of all kinds, I want to add my voice to those shouting, please save. The faith leaders I do most of my organizing with who are all situated on the south and west sides of Chicago are worried too. We were all on a call last week to talk about what happens post-election. As we expressed our deep concerns one by one, Pastor Otis Moss shared his reflection. He said, no matter who wins this election, we have to be clear as faith leaders what we are asking of the new mayor. We need to articulate a moral framework that we are asking them to follow as they bring the city together. No matter who wins, one of their biggest tasks will be trying 
to heal the divisions between us. Let's give them a picture of how to do that. So we decided we would each write up what we think needs to be part of the moral framework. And then we also decided we would invite people uh, from different faith traditions around the city. So not only interfaith traditions, which is Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, but reaching out to Buddhist leaders and Sikh leaders and to see who else would add to this moral framework. I nominated Pastor Moss to gather all of our thoughts and write something clear and concise because he is a published author after all. So we're hoping to send it to faith communities to use during this month of holy days as a call across the city to come together. You might have seen the article this morning in the Tribune by a part of this faith leader group, including Rabbi Seth Limmer, Reverend Sierra Bates Chamberlain, and Pastors Moss and Flager. It was an opinion piece and was titled, The Work of Chicago's Government Involves Us All. The point they were trying to make is that the next mayor is not going to save us. We don't need to shout Hosanna to them. Instead, it is up to all of us to be sure that what we want gets implemented. The example in the article was given of Moses who led the people out of Egypt. Moses would not be a name we recognize if not for the courage of a people who truly sought and were willing to stand up for their own freedom. Salvation has always been in the hands of the people, even when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. One of the reasons people have been so misled by the former president even as his crimes become more and more obvious, is that they are so focused on a savior, they have forgotten what is real. They want to shout Hosanna, and when they do, they're answered by one who loves adoration and money and power, and who is willing to lie and incite violence to keep the adoration coming. If you ever want to be able to, to distinguish the truth from lies, then just look at the story of Jesus again. Jesus was categorically not interested in adoration or in money or even in power other than the power to heal and end oppression. To get back to the Palm Sunday parade, we don't know if the Jesus parade that day was planned or spontaneous, or if it was even a parade or a kind of protest. But we can guess. We must never forget that the protest Jesus lived was not to create division, but in order to heal division. Power divides. Greed divides, fear divides, hatred divides. As despicable as Pilate was and as cruel, eventually killing Jesus, Jesus' message remained the same. Don't become your enemies. Find some way to love them. And Pastor Moss adds, and remember, love without justice is mere sentimentality. Amen.